Today on my podcast, I am going to be, what are you grateful for today? Um, well, I'm grateful that I'm alive because I had a few knee misses when I was in a bad place. Um, I'm grateful that I now can control that dark tunnel that exists around me. And, you know, and I think most of us have that um, issue. Mm. I've learned to control that with the help of my family and my daughters and obviously my counselling. And, um, and, and, and very good friends, you know, I, I've changed my life totally around. Um, I've gone from being a boxing promoter to a high profile trans woman to just a woman living her life the way she wants to live it now. Yeah. What, what do you do to maintain kind of your mental health? You know, I'm very big on routine, especially on my morning routine really really strict about that what's your routine do you have any specific routine i don't sort of live by routine i'm so i live in organized chaos but because i do have three very large dogs i know i have to get up every morning um and i have i have a hot lemon and ginger and mm. honey oh um, it's one of my favorite drinks then i I'll, I'll walk the dogs anything up to an hour or depending on if it's hot or what the weather's like I'll walk the dogs, I'll come back, I'll, I'll let my chickens and my uh, guinea fowl, my turkey out, and I'll check they're all right. And then I'll normally do um, an hour's workout. And on a Wednesday, I have uh, four clients that I do one-to-one uh, -one personal training with. And I have a client in the UK that I do train with over the, over the, over the uh, WhatsApp or Face FaceTime. And... Mm -hmm. um, then I may have, I potter around a little bit. Then I may go for coffee um, and meet some people or I'll just go into the little village and sit there and watch the world go by. And then, you then know, it sounds like, sounds like you've got a pretty good life going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I do still work. I mean, it's saying, you know, so like I, I, I check all my emails and I respond to everything as well in between. but I can do that sitting in the cafe so that's why I like it <laughs> yeah exactly so what training do you do these days do you still like hit the pads do you do any boxing I do um I still manage a female boxer I actually mm. manage a couple of boxers but one is active at the moment but obviously with the virus everything's very hard so it's mm -hmm. like a little bit still um personally I, I work on the punch bag and I, I do a few, a few boxing exercises in my own routine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's, let's talk about your, your transition, Kerry. Um, because for you, it was, um, it was a long time coming. I, I said to you before, um, before I press record today that I'd read your book and, um, and I devoured that in two sittings. I thought it was... Um, it was incredible and it certainly opened my eyes up a lot. I, I'll be honest, I knew very little about the trans community and it opened my eyes to the inside turmoil. I think it depends. Everything changes. Like now, everyone knows so much about the gender dysphoria and there's so much help out there. There's so much uh, advice. Some is good, some is bad. Um, but there's help there. And people are more acceptant of it, though there is at this moment it's crazy sort of backlash and attack from the right wing press and right wing people and certain feminist groups um, that are very anti trans women. Mm. Um, but overall, there's, there's a lot more help, you know, and a lot more advice, advice and guidelines. When when I was very young, there was none of that. And to be honest, I did. I knew I was different. I didn't know what I was different about and I didn't know why I was different. I, I didn't, I knew I was never gay because I never, I never was attracted to boys or if I'm honest, I wasn't attracted to girls either. Um, and I, I was brought up in a very um, macho family, you know, very working class, um, Irish dad, um, very sport minded and with two brothers. So, and it was it was very competitive, you know. Um, our father liked us to really take part in lots of sports and watch sport. 
we, we were never allowed to help my mum in the house, which was crazy. You know, <laughs> my father would go, that's a woman's job. My boys don't do things like that. You know, and today, you know, my, I, my father up until he got to his 60s, even maybe even a little bit, he didn't, he'd never made a cup of tea. You know, um, never boiled mm. an egg. And then mm. all of a sudden, he started being able to get, get up and do his own breakfast. And I'm like, oh, the world's changing. <laughs> My dad broke, my mum and my dad broke up. My dad went through a bad, both my parents went through a bad stage of depression um, because they couldn't handle the breakup. And then my dad came sort of back into my life. Well, and he'd met a woman. And I think this other woman helped my dad. I, my mum, again, was very old, traditional mum from an Irish family. It was her job to look after the family, to make sure the dinner was on the table. And I think the new woman that my dad met, um, she was slightly different. Yeah. A little bit more. She was more, yeah, well, let's go out, let's do this, let's eat out. You know, my dad started eating out more. Um, but I think for the first time, he, he started flying as well. You know, um, life, you know, and it is great that you live through all these different um, changes in, 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 in your lifetime. You know, I, you know, my age now, I would have thought, when I was young, my age, you were old, you was on your way out. But now I still think I'm very young. <laughs> I know, I'm literally 48 now. And like, I just think, God, where have the years gone? But, and I remember when I was younger, you'd look at, four, it's different now though. Well, I think it's, maybe it, we just think it's different to when we were younger. Because when we were younger, looking at people our age, it was. They, you'd think they were like really, really old. If I use my real age, you're ancient. But I, I never. <laughs> age from transitioning so I'm only six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true. You just mentioned that you you came from quite a traditional family like your dad was traditional and your mum was traditional yet yeah, when you um, decided to live within your truth and tell your family about it the uh, you were really surprised about the way that she responded. She responded absolutely incredibly and accepted everything and I just kind of wonder, have you ever thought if you'd maybe told your father? Because there were so many people when you kind of, you know, told them about your transition and, and what had been going on over the years that you thought may have responded a certain way. But they didn't. They responded very positively. Did you, have you ever thought that maybe your dad might have been one of those people? Has that yeah, thought I, ever crossed your mind? He does today. I mean, I know my father passed away in 2009, and if I'm honest, or 2010, it might be, I can't remember. No, 2010, if it was 10 years today, this, this year. Um, I, I often lay in bed at night, and you know, I think, and I actually speak to my dad. I know it's, it might sound crazy, and, and I ask him, and I just say, Dad, you know, I hope you understand what I went through. I hope you're as proud of me as you was as proud of Frank. Um, oh. You know, and I mean, I never get a response, so I never know what his answer is. But I don't know. It's I, I've my mother says he would never have understood. My brother, who's just started talking to me after ten years because he wouldn't accept when I first transition, he has said my dad wouldn't understand. Um, my other brother also says my dad wouldn't understand, and I and my dad's ex partner before she passed away, she said my father would never have accepted me or, or, or understood it because she, she never did either. She never, she could never accept why I transitioned. Not that I saw much, once my father passed away, I'll be honest, I never saw much of her because my mm -hmm. mother was alive. And to me, she was my father's companion and partner. And I had a lot of respect for her because the way she looked after my dad for his illness and everything else. But when my dad passed away, for me, there was no reason for me other than if I did see her to be polite and well mannered to her because her links with my family or with me, I personally I felt were over because yeah. my mum was still alive and yeah, I you felt that loyalty to your mum. Uh, I just mom. felt disrespect my mum. You know, mm. I, my children went and saw her because they they called her nanny too or whatever mm. you want. Uh, and I had no problems with that. Um but you know, I, I, I did sort of have problems with her trying to sort of, because she was my dad's wife. Uh, I used the word muscle in and try and be the, my 
my children's um, grandparents because she never had no children. She mm -hmm. never, she four, so she never had no children. But to me, my mum was alive, so I could never ever accept that. And I used to have to tell her, look, you're not my children's grandmother. Yeah. Your step relation to them. It's very much like today. People say my children disrespect me because they call me daddy when we're out in public. And I go, no, they don't disrespect me. That is, I am their dad, biologically. Mm -hmm. dad, and they have a mother. So how can, how can I disrespect the mother of my children? Which I don't. You know, I'm very friendly with my two ex-wives, which is very nice. Um, and, w w you know, we talk, we, 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 we see each other. Um, you know, I'm cl much closer to Tracy and I am to Emma's mum because obviously mm -hmm. that, that was a that was very long time ago. But but only last week I went out to dinner with Emma and her mum. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I just think that's um, that's nice. And I, I I think you know they must wonder how did we never know about this when we were married to this person? You know, and I don't know if they did know or if they had any sort of inkling. If they did, they will never say they did. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think there was little signs, but not enough signs to make people worry because sometimes I remember once my daughter went to me, why are you sitting so early like? And I didn't realize I was doing that. And I, I said, oh, I, I, I was just daydreaming. As soon as anyone, like I was very, I was very much into making sure that I was seen as very macho. And I think that was a lot of the problems. One of the reasons a lot of the comments I made um, which were quite outrageous in certain times and, and, and offences. I hold my hands up to that, you know. And, but it was all like a, you build a defence in front of you, you build a brick wall around you. And, and, and that was the way I, I done it, by, by being this arrogant little horrible man. I used to think I was a very nice man, but people told me I wasn't. Well, I'm sure you. I'm sure you were. I'm sure there was nice sides um, to you back then. Um, that's for sure. And we all go through stages when you know, saying things that we shouldn't, and you know, especially, I guess, for yourself, being in the public eye. You know, it's. I don't know. You. It must have been a, just a very bizarre experience for you. Um, when I when I was growing up, and I was always taught because I was in the boxing business from a very early age. And I was taught by some very good teachers. That's why I think I was quite good at the job. Mm. And told, remember this, no press is bad press. And what's in the papers today is tomorrow's chip paper. But yes, they were right in them days, but you forget the internet came along and the web okay. said, or you put out there. I can go back on the internet and put up stuff that I said and I read them and I think, how the hell did I ever say that? Mm. That, that's not me, but mm. it was me at that time, you know. So, mm. people out there never, never follow the um, teachings that I was brought up on. It, it's not paper tomorrow; it's on the internet forever. When you um, first kind of, when you retired from boxing, like really, you had two very significant events in your life. Um, you know, you, when you uh, you transitioned and then you retired from a career um, that you loved, um, or for many years that you loved, um, how did you navigate your way through that? Because just retiring in itself from a, a profession is, you know, along with that comes a lot of feelings of grief and a lot of loss. So you not only did you have that to contend with, you had your, you know, the transition as well. Well, I knew... I knew tr transitioning that I couldn't stay in the business. Well, I, and now I go back, I think maybe I could have stayed in the business, but I, I had lost a little bit of interest. Yeah. If I'm, um, I, I lost the love for it. Became It's a bit like what you just said. You think you've overstayed your welcome where you, where you are based now. I think you can, over like football managers, I think they can always overstay their welcome at football clubs. Uh, or or a chief executive, you know, because, and, and I I just felt that I was coming to the end. But I always entered boxing, and I always used to say this to everybody in my team: remember, one day, this is all going to end. It doesn't matter how it's going to end, but it's going to end. 
you know, Lennox Lewis's career is going to come to an end. You could fall out with Lennox Lewis. Another fighter might come along, but that's going to, the careers are short. So mentally, I was quite, and I'm quite strong mentally. I, I think I am, you know, on certain aspects I am. And I was mentally, I mentally prepared myself to, for it to come to an end. And I think, obviously, David Price losing his last two fights was fine. Maybe in the straw that broke the camel's back for me, because I, obviously, David Price was my golden goose at the time and was the one that kept my TV contract going. Mm. Um, and losing two fights on the trot by knockouts is not the greatest way to renegotiate a contract. Mm -hmm. I had young fighters, but the terms wouldn't have been as good. And I really, because on the second David Price fight, I did not want the rematch. And that's a well-known fact by everybody. I talk, I tried so hard to talk David out of the rematch, but David and his team insisted on it with his legal advice. Interesting, Matt, because that you didn't want that. That's not, yet you, I, well, the impression I got from the book was that you didn't want it, but you were too tired to like argue about it. You were, you know, it was almost yeah. like you'd lost that kind of passion to like say, right, this is what I want. And, but really in, re in retrospect, Maybe if you'd gone the route you had, it might have been a different different outcome there. But I don't know. Would have, should have. What people don't realise was I actually was transitioning, but I was living a double life at this mm -hmm. stage. I was living as Kelly part of the time, and I was living as Frank, and I was actually on hormones. Um, mm -hmm. I was quite emotional more than I'd ever been in my life, and I, and I also think that also affects all my judgment and everything. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm saying women are can't be successful in business because that's not what I'm trying to, what I'm saying is I was like, there was two people pulling inside me. There was the side that I wanted to be and I wanted to let out. And there was the side that was trying, there was the Frank that was trying to keep Kelly out of my life forever. Mm. I, I would lose my family. I feel I would lose everything. Um, but, you know, Kelly was a strong personality and she, you know, she, thankfully, she did come through in the right way in the end. And um, I, I just realised I couldn't go on because the two people fighting would have would have killed me. I would have, you know, uh, often I'd sat there and, and thought about suicide, you know, and it's been a known fact that I've attempted suicide a couple of times, three times, I think, overall. Um, four times, but one was just for help. I, I did the first one, I honestly admit to that, it was just for attention and help but um and, and i just felt i can't do this because if i don't if i don't come to terms with myself if i don't face myself and accept myself no one will ever accept me uh, and i'm gonna grow old miserable if i grow if i grew old that was you know i you don't know what was around the corner and i'd lost my love for the sport you know um I just didn't have, I didn't have the I didn't have that drive and that passion I, that I had right up to I, I suppose it also you, you we've got to step back from David Price as well I also lost a fight a very great fighter that I had great high hopes for and I really knew could be a world champion who who I found had committed suicide eventually or they killed themselves because um the Irish, the Irish boy. And I actually had a heart attack after that and I was in hospital. And I actually signed David Price while I was in hospital in my bed, having, just after my heart operation. Mm -hmm. If I had signed David Price then, I would have resigned from boxing anyway. Because mm -hmm. the Darren Sutherland thing really, and I haven't really spoken about this, but because but I've had lots of times, I started looking back at things and trying to analyse my life and why things change in someone's life. And that was it. And again, I go back a bit further as well. I had a great little fighter in Paul Ingalls, who I had utmost respect for too. It was Paul Ingalls and Scott Harrison. And both of them cases ended in tragedy. And so my love and my passion was beginning to fade anyway. And every time it faded, I don't know how it happened. Like Darren Sutherland came into my life. So it picked me up and like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it, then all of a sudden, a tragedy happened with Darren Sutherland and I I want to get out. But then I get the phone call, David Price is willing to sign a contract you've offered him, which was before uh, I found Sutherland. 
So I'm now in a situation where, okay, I'm going to sign the contract. Well, David Price will keep me going. And that, but there was nothing, I had not, I had never prepared for after David Price because I, I just felt, man, I honestly felt after the first Thompson fight. After I came out to Tracy, after my, my father's death, I knew there was, you know, no going back because the, the counselor told me once I took the lid off the Pandora box, mm-hmm. you don't put it on that box. And I'd done that. And I, I just wanted to live as the real me, to be honest, you know. Um, and I don't think the boxing world at that time would have been very acceptant of me. Um, you know, I don't think they are today, but some are and some aren't. You know, I saw some of the tweets. I saw some of the social media. I saw some of the recordings by top promoters in boxing, which have since disappeared because we've looked for them for one of the documentaries and they've mysteriously disappeared. Um, obviously, we pulled Dan. Um, oh, interesting. So, yeah. It's uh, interesting what people say, like to the media, what maybe what they should say and possibly maybe what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, they're pulling stuff down. And I and I I, I don't think um, I think I needed that break. I I I think you know my I burnt I burnt all my fuel, and yeah. I I was on another I was on a diff, I was on another journey. I was on a journey to discover myself, and to me that was more important than being a top. Yeah, and it sounds like what you've experienced you know, what you experienced within boxing, um, it's probably really helped, um, what's the word to use, prepare you for, for what you were to experience, um, yeah. you know, with the transition, like the likes of dealing with Don King, for example, who you would yeah. do anything that you could to discredit you, you know, and all the difficulties that you had around that. And, you know, you've got to be made of pretty tough stuff to, to deal with all of that. That rubbish. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I, 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 I'm mentally, in certain aspects, I say I'm very strong. I think I'm, quite, I'm very emotional, which I never was. I wasn't as I was emotional as Frank, but not as emotional as I am there. Um, and I do blame the hormones. So I don't. If females don't, agree, <laughs> that's the one thing. I honestly, and I say, and my daughters say, why don't you just stop take those hormone tablets or patches, whatever you're on, because you're too emotional. You cry too much, you know, and. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a complete, you know, I look at what, I remember what my counselor said to me when I finally said to my counselor, do you know something? I'm there. I'm, I'm locking. I am going to become my true self. I'm ready to face the world. And, And she said to me, do you know what? She said, Kelly, you've got to look at it like this. She said, you are starting your life all over again. She said, you're going to have to learn to walk, learn to sit, learn to talk, learn to go out. And she said, if you start dating, you're going to have to learn to date again. She said, it's totally different. She said, think of your friends. I said, what do you mean thinking my friends? They're not coming on this journey with me. They're not transitioning. She went, no. She said, they're going to be retiring. She said, and they're going to be either playing golf, going out to lunch, sitting in the pub or gardening. She said, you are going to be living a whole new life and experience something completely new. She said, you know, it's, you don't realize in a way how lucky or how, what you're going to go through. She said, it's, it may not, it's going to be a bit of a bumpy road. We all accept that. But if you do come to 100% terms with yourself and you can accept that, she said, you're going to have an amazing life. And you know what? That counselor was really true and right there. Mm. Has been, you know, I have spoken to a few friends who are sort of don't know what they want to do with their lives no more because they're coming to the end of their work in life and they've got no concept of what they want to do. Where I'm still learning and discovering things, you know, all right, my transition was six years ago. No, yeah, five years ago, let's say, maybe six, I started coming. It's about, I started coming out earlier, but living full, living totally and be, being the real me. And I am still learning things today, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it's amazing. It's, um, it, it's, it's fantastic, if I'm honest, yeah. 
Yeah, you sound like you're in a good place at the moment. And when you did transition, like you were so worried about what people would say. Well, I think it was more so your family. Um, yeah. You, you know, so, you know, you had a lot of the responsibility and the guilt was, you know, that you wouldn't hurt your family, which I completely understand. And I can't ever begin to think what you must have been going through. Um, but then when you were, you know, on the outside of things, you really were accepted by, by a lot of people and, and by your family too, or, or most of them. That must have been incredibly reassuring for you. Yeah, I, you know, as I say, I think I'm very lucky. I, I think, you know, all of us from the trans community, we fear rejection, we fear losing everything, we fear the very much loss of a family. You know, I've met some girls and, and boys that have transitioned the other way uh, that have been lost everything. You know, uh, I've also known a couple that were on the same journey as me, but never got to the end of the journey. Unfortunately, they took their lives. Uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very hard journey. It's a very sad journey. And some of us are very lucky. And I've met some that have got the same life as me and some that have, that have, have done this journey but live under, under the radar, shall we say. They've just moved into the site and they live a very big... Like what I wanted to do. And I know that if I, had a, if I wasn't Frank Maloney, the boxing promoter, I would have done that because I never had a problem. When I, when I started living as Kelly and going out and that. No one bothered me. I never got looked at twice. I never got picked on. I never got um, name called or anything like that. Maybe because I was only five foot two and I was quite slim and um, I, but when, when my story broke, it obviously social media and the idiots, you know, in the world, as I call them, the lager, the, what the keyboard warriors, um, they decided they could ever, it gave them a, um, rights to attack me and not just me to attack the trans community and and i'm not a trans activist i don't i don't want to be an activist um, can i just take this call it because it's yeah, my sure. lawyer hello 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 uh, it's not no i don't know what's happened hello It, no, English. Can you, sorry, can you phone me back in about 15 minutes, please? I'm in a meeting. Okay, can you phone me in 15 minutes? I'm in a meeting and then I can explain. Phone me, phone me back in 15 minutes, please. Okay. I don't know the call, I'll have to meet them. I'll, I'll come back to you, okay. Thank Katerina. Okay, they get, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. It's okay. What that was Portuguese, and I don't speak the language. See, you were saying um, you don't want to be a trans activist. No, I, I don't want to put myself up there on the pulpit. Mm. I want to help and support people, and I do help yeah. and support people. Yeah. So a lot online, uh, privately, I do one to one talking with them. I talk to quite a few parents that children are going through it. Um, but I don't want to be out there. Um, you know, every day, because I also feel sometimes some of us in the trans community, we are our own worst enemies. Um, we may demand too many rights when all, you know, I understand we should have health care. And I think that's very important. We should be given the same sort of um, treatment as anyone else on the national health. Um, you know, it's Gender dysphoria is not a mental issue. I do believe it's a medical issue. Mm -hmm. Because if it wasn't, we need doctors. 
you know, I, I heard Treasures May speaking saying it wasn't a medical issue, but to me, it is a medical issue because I saw more doctors than anyone during my transitioning. Um, so, it, and I do think, you know, we, we pay our taxes the same as anyone else. So we are entitled to the health care that everyone else should be entitled to. Um, mm. And, you know, I'm not saying all the treatment should be on, on NHS because not all the treatment is, is necessary, but there are certain treatments that are very necessary for, for people like myself um, to make their life full and complete. And that sort of treatment should be available and we shouldn't have to wait three or four years like the waiting list is and things like that because that that's wrong because you know i paid as much tax as the next person's to me you know i was lucky that i had the money to go private so i never had to go through all the i didn't have to jump through all the hoops and um jump over all the fences because i i went private um and you know i get a few trans people attacking me because of that uh, oh, it's all right for her because she had money, you know. Um, but I worked for my money. It wasn't as if I was giving, I wasn't giving, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't just pick it off a tree. I mm. worked for it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worked even at times when I was really suffering with depression. I still worked and ran my business. Mm. You, know, uh, I, you know, I know a few trans people say, oh, we can't work because we're in such stress, we're in such pressure, you know, we, and they want everything. You, there are, there are certain lines, like I've got a friend who transitioned at the same time as me, and her life was made a misery at work. So she had to sign off at work. But she still never went through the NHS. She, um, she was saving her money while she was working. She eventually got a financial settlement with the company because of the way they treated it and everything else. But it took a long time, and it took it to show how strong she was to stand up to them people. Mm. I think that's what some of us must learn to do in the trans community, stand up more for our rights and for our um, protection, but not make enemies. I'm, mm -hmm. You know, if someone disagrees with me, that's fine. If someone doesn't underst understand me, that's fine. They're entitled to their opinion. I'm not going to go to war over someone saying I'm still a man because if they think that, they can think what they like. Um, but, I'm, you know, I'm not going to... I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to respond. I, I actually think it's better not to respond to anyone because you're giving them better, you're, you're just ignoring them because of their ignorance. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Do you, um, do you still get depression, Kelly? You know, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I hit a brick wall mm. and I didn't talk to anybody and I didn't go out. Um, Eventually, my daughter sort of got me talking again, and she came out to see me, and it really helped me. Yeah, um, I don't know why, because my life wasn't in a bad place at the time. It just, yeah, I, I do say that I live with this dark tunnel, yeah, around, and every so often I slip into this tunnel. Well, not every so often, thank heavens. Um, now and again, um, but as long as I can see that light, I can pull yeah. my way out. Of when you go further into the tunnel, like I did in October 2018, when I couldn't see no light, and mm -hmm. that's when I was really, really bad, and I ended up in a psychiatric hospital um, here in Portugal, and I think that might have scared me as well. Mm -hmm. And I realised since then that I could never go in a place like that again. Mm -hmm. So it has helped me. So I, I think I've learned to control my depressions a bit more better now, mm -hmm. and it helped with dogs. I realised. I know this sounds silly, but if anything happened to me, who's going to look after three bloody monsters? That um... <laughs> I love them. I absolutely love dogs. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm we're family. The dogs and me are family. Of course. Yeah, you know, Turkey and me are family. So it's I. I've changed my life around in that way, mm. and you no, know, I'm not going to say I'm never going to go into that dark tunnel because. As I said, I, I started slipping in there about a couple of weeks ago, but I managed to get out of it pretty, as, not as quick as I got in there, but I managed because it was something very, um, very special to me. And I wanted to get out there because I know where I went before and I don't want to go, I don't want to go to that place again. You meditate, 
Do you visualize and meditate? Not as much as I should do. I, I, I'm not great at holding my concentration. I'm, I'm, I'm an active person. Mm. I, I, I would go in the gym more than I would meditate, to be honest. Yeah. I think with anything, it's, it's just a matter of practice. Being able to still your mind, um, you know, obviously the first few times you do it, it's not going to be easy, but the more you practice, like the easier it gets. Um, I do guided me uh, meditations. I'll send you some through. I do them. I release them on my podcast. So I'll send you some. I mean, they're only short ones, so they're great as a, you know, as a starter. Yeah, just for like 15, 20 minutes or so. And um, they all incorporate breathing as well. Um, so I like breathing properly yes yeah. yeah i just think you know if you do a little bit of breath work before you um meditate it just or before you still your mind it just kind of primes your body for kind of relaxation and it gets all that energy flowing all that stagnant energy um as a guy i'm sure you've heard of wim hof yeah Iceman. yeah have you ever tried any of his guided breathings? He's got some on YouTube that like, he's got a longer one for about 40 minutes, but he's got a short one for 11 minutes. And I'm telling you, they're absolutely incredible. They're amazing. Definitely, um, if you've not tried them, it's definitely worth okay, maybe I'll giving them, giving them a go. Send me the link, I'll have a look at them. I will do. Um, Kelly, I'm keen to know what your, um, what your view is on um, transsexuals and um, men who have transitioned to women playing professional sport. Um, right. This is not something you don't want to answer because I know it's quite a sensitive thing. Well, right. I'm a great believer that sport is open to everybody. I'm a great believer the sport should be a level playing field. I honestly believe it depends I don't think someone who is just starting their transitioning should be allowed to compete in women's sport. Um, I don't believe in, I don't think that's fair, but I believe it depends how far they've transitioned, depends how far the level of testosterone is when it's measured. And more to the point, it, it, you go by the, I don't think women's box, there are certain sports that women and men can't compete against each other. And I also think also, you'll never see women and men competing against each other. And maybe there are certain sports that trans women shouldn't be allowed to compete in. Um, one could be boxing. Um, you know, because um, they, listening to some of the medical advice, they say that we still maintain that. So, but I can only speak about myself. I know I'm a lot weaker than I was. I know I'm not as strong as I, I was. My endurance is not as good as it was, but maybe as well, that's a little bit of age with me as well. So, uh, but to me, there's not been enough medical research into this. There's mm. too many who don't know what they're talking about, just jumping on the bandwagon. And one is Sharon Davis, the swimmer. Mm. She, you know, when I will not make a full and honest comment other than I believe sport's open to everybody. It should be a level playing field. Um, and you know the trans people that are in sport are not breaking no rules they're following the rules of the governing body so again the argument is not with us trans people it's with the governing bodies so leave us alone and have your argument with the governing bodies um, you know Sharon Davis moans because she was beaten by an East German that was on testosterone that person who beat Sharon Davis was not a trans woman it was a woman that the Ger East German because it was an East German at the time and we all know what these germs done. They were pumping their females full of testosterone to make them stronger, to more, more determined. So their level was even greater than probably most men's was. You know, so, and it was a long time ago. So let's, you know, let's, let Sharon Davis get this right. She has never been beaten by a trans woman. You know, name to me any trans women that have really excelled in sport. There's none. There's none. This great fear that everyone's going to all of a sudden want to be a woman just to compete in sport is crazy. So until the full medical reports are done, and you know, and as long as we as trans people follow the governing rules of the bodies, the sport that we're taking part in, we're not breaking no rules. Think about 
younger people transitioning i mean you know you can have a sex change from the you know uh, age of 18 and i know there's um a friend of mine her well she's my best friend i was a, a bridesmaid her daughter dated uh, a a guy i don't know all the details but i believe he went through the transition and then he regretted it and wanted to go back what do you think about this happening when someone's you know when they're really young do you you well, know again it's there are there are certain guidelines that we all have to follow you know this is you can go to war at 18 you can vote at 18 you're you're technically an adult at 18 18 is you know most people at the age of 18 have their mind made up what they want to do um so to me at 18 that's not a that's not, to me that that is the choice of the individual um if they really believe they're trans they've got trans dysphoria and they want to transition that's not that's not but again they won't exactly transition dead at 18 they still have to go through all the um loopholes through the journey see the right people you are going to get one or two people who the grass always looks greener on the other side so you may get one or two people that may have been think they're either a lesbian or a gay man but they think no we're not we're really a woman or we're really uh, a man and they want to transit and then when they transition they realize they're not i i can never use the names because my counselor never told me but a counselor i was seeing she was seeing a middle a guy from the middle east who was living with a, his partner who was a middle east his family would not accept him because they were two men and in, that, in their community gays are not accepted but he was under the impression that if he transitioned his family would accept him because he'd be a woman and his family and when he told his family this the family said yes but what he doesn't realize is by transitioning his partner wasn't in love with a woman he was in love with a man because his partner's gay so if he transitioned the counselor's trying to tell him your partner may not be in love with you anymore that is not the answer um so i don't you know I don't, I don't believe people should transition very young in age but i also believe that if a young child believes they're born in the wrong body i have talked to a few parents who said to me and i would say look i'm not a doctor so i don't really, i can only tell you what i would do and my philosophy would be i would just say okay just continue normal you know if they've got a boy who wants to put a dress on just that, but don't make a big fuss about it. Don't show, don't put that on him. Just let him do it and then move on with the day. It's, it's all about support, care and love to me for someone that's young. That person will find if they're really transgender, that will not go away. So when they get to a bit older, 18, 19, and if they, then they go on that journey of transitioning. You know, I'm not an expert in it, so I, I can't. Yeah. Really, I, I, you know, I can only tell what I know, and and I think that if you look back, there's a lot of self harm. The transgender community have the biggest rate of uh, suicide and attempted suicide than any other group in in society. So there must, you know, all I know is that I'm a much better person since I've transitioned. So for me, it was the right thing to do. Mm. And I'm sure it, there's much more people who are a lot more happy than regret transitioning because it's been, um, it, it's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I guess when you're younger, there's just the whole identity thing, you know, like I'm a different person now to what I was when I was 18. And I think we all go through that. Those may be identity crises when, when we're younger. I mean, how many genders are there out there now? I can't keep up with the different genders and I don't understand them. I honestly don't understand them. There's gender neutral, um, gender queer, you know, you keep got, there's two spirits, there's gender drag. Um, you know, um, I, you know, I know someone that it depends how they wake up in the morning, depends if they're a man or woman. So, can, I, you know, I was brought up to believe there was only two genders. Um, and there was, shall we say, three sexualities and bisexual. 
So four. But when I say two genders, there was three. There was intersex. There's always been intersex, where which is slightly because I, you know, I've met a couple of people that are intersex as well. Um, and that that's very hard because their sexuality is chosen by the doctor at their birth. Right. What's intersex? Sex is where they're born with both. Um, uh, both ge gen genitalia, right? Okay, got you. Knowing what you know now, what would you say to your younger self? Knowing what you know now. I, I think I would have said to my younger self, do you know what? You've got to be brave. You've got to face yourself. And you can live a really not a good life. Um, yeah. And if I went back on my life, would I transition earlier? Part of me would say yes, and part of me say no, because I've been very lucky with the love of my children. So if I had a transitioned early, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had my children in my life. Uh, so it's a very hard question. But I think I might have said to my younger self, you know what, you've got to be brave. You've got to face the truth. That way, that way, you may not cause it or upset as many people. Because I know this journey wasn't just about me. This journey was about my partners that I left behind and my children. So they've had to go on a, a journey and rediscover everything. So it's not just about, you know, transgender people who think it's all about them are very selfish people. It's not just about you. It's about family. It's about everything. And you have to look at all that. You know, at the end of the day, you still have to go on your journey because I had to. So it's, but you have to look at the destruction, the consequences, and the final outcome. I kind of can empathise with people now, whereas before I didn't feel like I could. Until you've experienced it, you, you don't really get it. It's like until you experience loss and grief. Before I'd lost my granddad, I didn't really get it when people were grieving i'd go through the motions and say i'm sorry but yeah. but now but but now i know so but i guess what i'm getting to is you know when you do have like a couple of weeks ago you had a bit of a dip and, and a low time it's just really important to focus on what you have got in your life and you have got such a wonderful loving family around you you've got your dogs who rely on you as well but you've also got your kids and and in many ways, God, you're in such a blessed position to, to have that. And there's so many, so many people haven't got that. And like yourself says, so many transgender, transgender gone through the whole process, feeling really, really lonely and, and not having that support as well. Yeah, I know. And it's hard for them. And, you know, my heart goes out to them people. And, you know, I... I, I I just don't know. And it's all about, you know, society. You know, as I said, I don't expect everyone to understand or like me. But what I do is expect people to respect me the same as I would res I respect most other forms of human life. Because we're all different. You know, the world is not black and white the way I thought it was, but the way I grew up. The world is black, grey. There's a very big grey area and, and white. And there's also... A few multi colours out there. Mm. You've experienced you've experienced so much in your life, uh, Kelly. Is there anything else that you haven't experienced? Any goals or any future ambitions that you would like to to work towards? Uh, one thing, uh, if I'm honest, the one thing that I think about is I had a very loving relationship with my partner. Obviously, when I transitioned, that relationship came to an end. And I wonder, and I mentally prepared myself that I would live the rest of my life alone and just have a nice social life, which I, which I have got. So, mm -hmm. and as I said, my, my ex-partners are very friendly with me. But I, I, I probably wonder, will I ever meet anyone that I will share my life with? Yeah. Or will I always be Kelly Maloney, the person that's invited to the dinner party and they're sitting there, and they're, you know, chatting with everybody, very friendly socially. But not have a have a partner. Yeah. yeah. That's probably that's that's the thing that worry and I, I though I say that I've built my life, I've positioned myself that's what's gonna be my life. I don't say never. 
I do say if I walk into a room, I walk into somewhere and the light goes on in my head and that person connects with me, then I would pursue that relationship and see how mm -hmm. it works out. Yeah, it's funny. I said a similar thing recently about my life because I'm single and I don't have kids. And um, I obviously I would love to have to have children. So I kind of maybe experienced a bit of a loss there. But uh, one thing that I do, and it might be useful for yourself to do this, is kind of visualization and, and meditations. And like when you you're in that, it's like living the event as though the um, living the event as though it's already happened so this is something that i do a lot of when i'm being still and i'm meditating and the important thing is to feel the emotion of the event so it's like how would you feel with your partner you know when you've, you're experiencing that love There's a lot of scientific research being undertaken by the likes of dr joe Dispenza. we can change like the neural pathways in our brain to to kind of elicit events that we do want and when you marry the emotion with the event but you haven't got that companion say at night when you're sitting here and you want to chat with someone um, yeah i i don't know i i i i don't know either i could even think about that because i i'm very much in conversation with people and i believe if the person can't stimulate my mind they're not going to stimulate my body so mm. there's no having that emotion. Mm, mm. It's very, it is very, very powerful. I'm not sure how long we've been chatting for now, but I just want to ask you a couple of questions about boxing. Is that okay? Yeah. Is, <laughs> do you ever think that the heavyweight division, because when you were involved in boxing, it was just incredible in the 90s. And it's never ever got back to that. You think it's ever going to get back to that? How it okay. was? Similar to what I said earlier, you can only live in the areas you live in. Mm. Heavyweight boxers from then are different to heavyweight boxers today. You know, people say that when I lived, but I never lived in the era of Muhammad Ali, Joe mm -hmm. Frazier, um, Larry Holmes, people like that. So it just goes in phases. So. I'm obviously going to be honest and think that I lived in the best era of heavyweights, and, you know, and boxing then was a lot better. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a great lover of boxing now the way it's gone because I think it's lost its magnitude. It's more like producing shows for TV. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe in now, you know, especially with this virus because nothing can happen at the moment. You know, mm -hmm. no, no, motor, no boxer unless he's with one of the big two can get any work mm, I know Dana I don't know if you follow the UFC but uh, Dana White's over here in Abu Dhabi at the moment on Fight Island and um, I mean, that guy is just such a, a grafter such a worker but I know they're having fights you know uh, over there um, I don't know whether or not people are actually going to see them I'd probably not I'm not so sure Dana White is a very clever guy he completely the UFC is totally run different to boxing. Mm. Fighters are signed to UFC, but boxers are not signed to boxing organisations. Mm -hmm. When you're, what would you like your legacy to be? When you're no longer here, what would you like people to say about you? I don't know. Um, yeah, I've never thought about that. Um, I don't, honestly, I don't know. I've never really, uh, you know, I make jokes about it, but I've never really, on a serious note, I've never thought about it. Um, my legacy is what I leave behind. Yeah. You know, I can't make my legacy. It's what people think of me. Mm. I will always be known as the first English manager to um, produce an undisputed weight champion in the world in 100 years. Um, I will be known as the first boxing promoter to transition openly. Um, I, I honestly don't know. You know, I might be known for other bad things um, and other good things. Um, but, you know, as long as I can put my head on the pillar at night and know that I can sleep with myself and wake up in the morning and lay straight in bed, what I think a lot of people can't do, 
in the boxing world and in other worlds. Um, I'm, I'm happy with myself. Yeah, that's incredible. Kelly, thank you so much for your time. I certainly think you're an inspiration. And I think so many other people out there do. as. Would you say that you found inner peace? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But I'm at peace with myself now and I'm very contented with myself. I'm not going to say that I don't have damn moments because I do, but 99% of my life now is totally at peace with myself. That's and good. It's a nice place to be. And, and I truly... I, I truly think when, when you're at that place, um, that's when everything that you want in your life is going to come. So let's watch this space. <laughs> I've about lit someone in my life because I'm also another thing my counsellor told me that I've always never let anyone, never let negative people into your life. Yeah. I did let a couple of people into my life. And, you know, as I say, in 2018, I nearly killed myself over an issue. Um, you know, I thought I'd met someone not long ago. Again, it wasn't the right person. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's, um, but that's not, that's not to me. I, my daughter says, right, my oldest daughter said to me, remember this, Dad, something you always told us. You don't need anyone in your life, but you'd like some you'd like someone in your life. And I think if I keep to that philosophy, I'm going to be fine. 100%. And I think when these situations or relationships don't work out, it's just kind of paving the way for the next one or the right person to come into your life. You learn from every, everyone, don't you? You learn from all your mistakes. That's, how I, that's what I believe in. Yeah, 100%. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for being a guest today. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out. That's right. Will you send me the link when you put it up? I will do, definitely. So I will probably come out uh, around about Monday next week and um, I'll send you the link um, yeah. and the little snippets. I get little videos done and little snippets, little audiograms done as well. All right then, thank you very much. Uh, 